All righty. Well, let's get started. Um, our first presentation today is by Barry Melowanchuk, and I was going to do anything to pronounce that correctly, so I hope I, hope I got it. Uh, VE4MA, uh, Barry's been active on 432 since 1966 and 10 gigs since 1968, uh, so he's been around for a while, and uh, he's uh, authored and presented at many amateur conferences on EME, feed horns, solid state and vacuum tube power amplifiers, and low noise amplifiers. He's received the Central States VHF Society John Chambers Award in 2000 and again in 2006, uh, 2008. The AWRL's Microwave Development Award in 2003. The Nor Northern Lights Radio Society's Westland Award in 2008. And the Microwave Update Don Hilliard Award in 2016. So uh, uh, Barry has certainly been around and knows his stuff. And he's going to talk to us about high performance radio systems for 47 and 78 gigahertz. Well, this is nice. I hope it works. Everyone hear me okay? Good stuff. And I just got to figure out the mouse, and I think I got that okay. It'd be good. Yep. Yep, I see it there. So today I'm going to talk, talk to you about high-performance radio systems for 47 and 78. Uh, I've been working on these things for a little while now, and uh, they're not necessarily uh, the best, but they're pretty high-performance, so... So, um, no, wrong button, there we go. My thumbs are too big. So, in talking about it, I'm going to talk about the need for high performance systems, talk about some of the new technologies available now, and then talk about what I actually have done to build some systems and some work that I still need to do. So, modern communication system designs facilitate really long-haul communications, and, and I think you guys have all seen that with 10 gigs and whatever, but the, 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 you know, the new technologies that we're using in there are low-phase noise uh, local oscillators, very stable and low-cost reference oscillators, low-noise figure receivers, good transmit powers, and now image rejection techniques. So, I mean, obviously good hardware allows long-haul QSOs. I mean, there's operator skills, but you've got to have good hardware or you're not going very far. And now, we, of course, we've got new digital modulation techniques that give us some additional dynamic range beyond what, uh, what we can hear. And the extra system performance uh, allows us distance and propagation mode attempts beyond the line of sight PES. Like, I know many of the the uh, upper microwave bands, we've never had enough uh, horsepower to be able to even consider beyond line of sight, but now it's starting to happen, so. And we'll find out at, at what point do, uh, does it stop be behaving like radio and, and strictly go uh, in a straight line, so. Anyway, and then in the new technologies, we've got low phase noise local oscillators. You know, we've seen them become the norm. I mean, you know, it's been a long time uh, probably 10 years or more, we, everyone had the kind of the Demi uh, LOs that used to drift in the, in the wind uh, out in the field, and, and we had, uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, that, that was basically it, or Frequency West bricks that used to move around. And the phase noise performance on the, on the uh, original phase noise, uh, phase lock loops was pretty poor at the microwave up, up, upper bands. You know, down at VHF, it was, it was okay, but uh, I think Paul Wade talked about that quite a bit, uh, you know, what it did to your minimum discernible signal. We were all suffering a couple of dB there. Now things are greatly improved. I mean, there's so many new phase lock loops that are, uh, you know, really good noise performance. And, and I haven't done a direct comparison, but they seem to be very near the level of the good frequency West bricks. Now, nowadays, I don't know how many good bricks there are left running. They're all getting pretty old. And of course now they allow multiple frequency, uh, frequencies to be uh, programmed in and you know you can easily switch between them which is kind of nice especially for the higher bands. 
and they're relatively low cost. Uh, I don't know what a frequency West brick was new. We never paid for them new, of course, or at least not many of us. But, you know, when you're talking about a couple hundred bucks for a pretty fancy phase-locked oscillator that's at 13 gigs with low phase noise, that's pretty good value. So our, our uh, choice of units, uh, and, and I've got a couple of examples here. There's probably more, and, and, uh, and I certainly have no preference, but, you know, the typical units available, you know, Kuhn has got uh, a nice one. Uh, ZL2 BKC has got a new one. Uh, Q5 signal has got one. Uh, I'm not sure how it compares in terms of phase noise, but for at least the lower microwave bands, it looks really good. And uh, I've used some uh, surplus Verticom units, and I know a few others. WW2R has written up quite a bit on that over the years as well. So, you know, there's, there's some pretty good units available off the shelf. And this is what the Kuhn one looks like, you know, a nicely machined box. And again, I've got no uh, particular affiliation to Kuhn, but it's a good picture anyway. And uh, anyway, all of these phase-locked oscillators need a good, stable, uh, and, and for us, we want low cost, of course. You know, so surplus uh, is always good, but uh, most of them use 10 megahertz. I know there was a few that would use 100 megahertz, but 10 megs is certainly the, uh, the common one, and they're cheap and plentiful on the used uh, eBay market and, uh, you know, really cheap. I think, uh, you know, anything uh, 15 bucks and more, uh, 15 to 35 bucks, and you've got a pretty good unit, I think. So quick warm-up, much better than the uh, International Crystals and the Old Frequency West bricks that took a long time to warm up, and I know there were some tricks to try and improve that, but it's still a lot better now. And of course, you can keep your 10 meg reference running while you're in between QSOs if you're uh, rovering. And of course, the phase noise is not always uh, as good on some of the low-cost uh, OCXO or uh, TCXOs, so you, you do have to watch that. You know, cheap is, uh, is not always the, uh, the best thing. You, you uh, do have to look for some higher quality units if you want uh, performance on the higher bands. A couple of the ones that I spotted uh, on eBay, and, and I haven't tried them all, but, it, you know, Certainly some of them there. Acilla Quartz makes some fine stuff. And Trimble, there's lots of the Trimble oscillators around. Um, lots of them around. And they're just, you go on eBay and there's all kinds. But again, watch out for the, uh, you know, the ones that are kind of non-name brand. They may not be the best. So, so anyway, this is what, a, you know, some of the typical ones look like. You know, a little module and, you know, there's four or five or six pins on the backside and, and uh, and pretty easy to use. So, okay. So now low noise figure receivers. Well, in the early 2000s, you know, there was such an explosion in the deployment of 26 to 40 gig microwave radio systems, and I think that spurred a lot of the chip development. And we've certainly benefited from that, and continue to, be to benefit from uh, from that. Uh, the U.S. military, of course, uses 45 gigahertz for satellite systems and and now we've got commercial microwave running 10 gigabits per second at 64 and 80 gigahertz. And, and uh, there's just so much development going on there now. And, and some of that is spinning off to the new 5G cellular uh, uh, millimeter wave frequency. So, you know, there's bound to be some good spinoff for us on that. And certainly, uh, well, they're not looking for really low noise figures, but compared to, a, you know, a crummy old mixtures that we used to use, it's still a lot better. So... So all of these new, te new systems that are going in, they need mixers, LNA, amplifiers. Probably a lot of it's going to be integrated into modules, so perhaps getting access to all of those bits and pieces uh, as separate parts may be difficult, but we could probably work them into the systems. So, so with the, the low-noise chips uh, you know, that are available, of course, most of them require surface mounting as a minimum, and, and then there's the question of, uh, you know, you're dealing with the bare chip. It's wire bonding, right? Or can you do something with silver epoxy under a microscope? And eh, it's pretty hard to use chips. I know there's a few guys that have got access to bonding machines. Um, fortunate for the, the ham community, Kuhn Electronics has been selling assembled amplifiers and Etc. with uh, using these chips for 24 and 47 since the early 2000s. And uh, 
And now even at 78 gigahertz, you know, amplifiers are available at what I'll call reasonable cost. If you looked at the, you know, the, the cost of doing it any other way, like I know Tom did some 78 gig amplifiers and he was doing it for, for free and it was still, you know, a good buck. You know, it's, it's, it's expensive technology and machining, so, you know, the, the CUNE prices are not unrealistic, so. And that's what their, uh, their amplifiers look like for 47, and they've got several versions of 47 amps, and then now the 76 uh, low noise amplifier. So transmit powers, higher transmit powers. Well, in the early days, early, let's say 2000s, you know, we were using low noise amplifiers as uh, low power transmitters and just reversing them, right? transmit receive, just like we saw it today on uh, 78 gigahertz with a, one of Tom's uh, uh, receive amplifiers and reversing it for transmit and receive. And uh, the terrestrial and satellite uh, radio systems need more power to support the wider bandwidth transmissions that they're doing. Like I mentioned, 10 gigabits per second. You know, it's, I don't know what the baud rate is, but it's, they're still dealing pretty big bandwidth and, and they need more power to get any distance because we know path loss on the higher bands is, is pretty high and, and it, those higher bands are the only ones they have to be able to run the big bandwidth systems. So, you know, there, there is more, well, I mean, we're seeing one watt amplifiers showing up now for uh, 78 gigs. So, and, and there's just so much development going on into high power amplifier chips using improved technologies and materials for the chips. You know, the gallium uh, nitride uh, chips are starting to show up and uh, I'm not sure uh, how many of the packaged amplifiers are using that, that technology or whether how much is still gas or, or what it is, but, but they're working hard to, to get more out of, uh, out of chips, uh, get a little more power. One of the problems that we have, and Tom and I were just talking about this a little bit earlier, uh, <coughs> filtering techniques, you know, radio systems, um, commercial microwave radio systems or satellite systems need to be able to change frequencies without hardware changes. And that's pretty tough to do if you've got to do image filtering and local oscillator filtering and, and all that sort of thing. And traditional bandpass filters really just aren't, aren't going to be flexible enough for this kind of a, a need. You know, it's, uh, you know, you'd have to keep a spare filter for every frequency you're using or put a lot of filters into all your, a whole bunch of different spare modules, which is just not the way things are done. It's all expensive, so. The image reject te technique is, uh, is out now. It's not new. I mean, it's been around since the, uh, what was it, uh, Central Electronics 20A uh, phasing rig back in the 50s or whatever it was. But it now it's so much easier to implement on a chip at the higher frequencies. They can control the tolerances. So, you know, the consistency uh, is, is in there. Uh, again, it's you know, normal chip type stuff, you know, you're reproducing it on mass, easy to do. And then, so that really rela relaxes any uh, other filtering requirements. You're, you're knocking down your image, you're getting your LO rejection down. As long as these numbers are good, you know, that's all you need to do. So it really simplifies uh, um, radio technology, let's call it, at the higher frequencies. And that's what's been implemented on the new uh, Kuhn 76 gigahertz transferter. And, uh, you know, the specs are, are okay. They're not uh, super, but good enough for ham use anyway. And for 47 gigs, I know there's a few of us using those, uh, that particular transverter. It's been around for a few years now. Same thing, phasing. So anyway, if you're, you're building a radio, high performance radio system for 47 gigahertz, I mean, Kuhn has got all the pieces. You know, it's getting hard to find surplus pieces to do all of this. And, you know, Kuhn has got the pieces, you know, it's money and, and, you know, it's fairly expensive, but you know, it's good value. You can get all the pieces you need, transverter, phase locked LO, power amp, bandpass filters. It's all there. You know, the, the basic transverter that, uh, that I showed a picture of a minute ago is only 30 milliwatts out. So, you know, we'd like to run a little more than that. I mean, we used to, you know, dream of getting 30 milliwatts when we were running just mixers, but now, you know, there's a one watt PA that's available. 
And it's really nice to be able to have one watt up there. Although I think when you companion it with the, the Kuhn transverter, it only gives you about a half watt out. Uh, just not quite enough gain in that uh, combination. And so anyway, you do need a driver amp to get the additional one watt out. Unfortunately, the image reject spec is, is only 17 dB with that Kuhn transverter. And the LO leak through is not specified and, and is a bit of a concern. So in, in my experience, a bandpass filter is required, an external bandpass filter to reduce the LO leakage. You know, particularly, you know, I talked about using that driver in order to get to the final one watt out. Well, I don't know what the one dB compression point is. It's probably a half watt and I'm operating at a watt. So the fact that you're running in compression, your LO level relatively comes up, right? And so does your image. So if you're going to run the one watt, then you, you need some additional filtering. You know, the received noise figure of that, that Kuhn system is, is not bad, again, compared with the old diode mixers, right? 6 to 7 dB, but, you know, it's not super. You know, I wanted to do better than that, and uh, I was very fortunate to have a an extra, a spare EME preamp with roughly three and a half dB noise figure. So I added that in there with a, a bandpass filter to improve the image rejection because the, the preamp that I was using probably had a little more gain down towards 45 gigahertz where it was originally intended. And so it would, could make the image rejection even worse because of the, uh, the peaking in the gain down there. So. And then, of course, to complete the transverter, you've got all these bits and pieces. You need to put a four-state sequencer and then some kind of an IF interface. The Kuna has got an IF interface in there, but it uh, didn't quite give me the flexibility I wanted in there. So, And I wanted to, to kind of standardize an interface to the FT817. Now, I use WR22 waveguide for... Uh, for there, but the, the, you know, the antenna that I was using was WR28, and I f forget who it was uh, earlier was talking uh, uh, and where that was, but uh, you know, the fact that it's 28 and it's a 40 gigahertz antenna, yeah, it's a bit of a compromise there, but I just kind of, all right, well, that's something to look at down the road here a little bit. So this is the block diagram of the system. So I've got, uh, WR22 waveguide inside, 28 here. I actually have a, I do have a, a waveguide taper so that I'm going from 28 to 22 in there, so at least there's not a hit, but then I'm not sure what the SWR is there. Four-point waveguide switch, the surplus LNA, a bandpass filter, and then into the Kuhn transverter. And then coming out of the Kuhn, I've got a level set variable attenuator, and then I've got the driver amplifier, which is a 125, 150 milliwatts, and then a one watt amplifier. And I've got a Kuhn uh, PLL, but it's not the latest. It's the older generation that's uh, fixed frequency, but still 10 meg reference. And a four step sequencer, and, and then uh, the Donnie's microwave TCKIF interface is what I used with a 144 uh, interface radio. So this is what the system looks like. I'll flip this around a, f a few ways. Maybe hard to figure out, but there's the waveguide switch in here. It's hard for me to even see what's in there. The LNA is in here. This is a bandpass filter. Uh, the QNLO is in here. The QN transverter is here. So you can see the two waveguide ports coming out of the QN. Uh, so this is the receive path. Now, transmit-wise, I come out of here, and it's nice to have a bunch of bits and pieces of waveguides so you can fold this all around. And it takes a little bit of juggling in order to make it fit, too, right? This is the level set attenuator that I had. And then you can't really discern the two amplifiers, but one is the driver and one is the PA, and they're tucked in under here, and then the, uh, the waveguide is in. Now, the Q, the Q and amplifiers use uh, WR19 for the waveguide, and... Uh, I didn't really, I, I don't have 19, I didn't want to go there, I had lots of 22, so I just, you know, bolt the two together. I think I ended up modifying pieces here to, uh, to uh, connect to the 22 and use the flanges that uh, Kuhn needed because they're a little bit different than the, uh, the flanges we normally use. But uh, it all seems to work, so, 
You know, you use what you got, right? Unless you buy the whole thing, and I guess now you can go, probably go buy the waveguide switch assembly from Kuhn, but I don't think they have a... Uh, well, I guess they have a separate preamp that you could use. Can't remember what the noise figure is, 5 dB or something, which is still okay. Can't remember what the basic transverter was. So that's another shot. Whoops. Get back on that, maybe. Okay, there we are. So there's the, again, on receive path, this is a waveguide filter. And that was the preamp, and then going right into the transverter, and then coming out, going around through the level set attenuator, and then into the driver amplifier, and then somewhere the power amplifier is hiding in here. So, And my TCK interface and, uh, is in here, and this is my 10 meg reference uh, oscillator assembly, and I had a, uh, one of the four-port splitters in there so that I could uh, feed other systems like uh, the 78 system. You know, it's how many 10 meg references you're going to run on a site, right? And, you know, you end up saying, well, okay, am I going to run this one independently of the two? No, I'm probably going to operate 47 and 78 together at the same time. So we'll uh, kind of save a little bit on the electronics that way. So for 78 gigahertz, now Kuhn has, has got all the pieces that you would need to put a good system together. Uh, now, these numbers were relative to 78 gigahertz, not 76. They're a little better at 76, but you can get that transverter and the phase-locked LO, and the power amplifier is built in. It's 250 milliwatts at 76 gigs, but uh, and they're having some trouble with the, get, guaranteeing the specs at 78, so they actually don't want to provide a 78 transverter, only 76. So, And 8.5 dB noise figure, which... Again, that's, that's pretty darn good compared to, uh, you know, the diode uh, mixers that we've been using. And I think most of the diode mixers we've been using have probably not been very good at all. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, 20 dB image rejection, that's a little better than uh, the 47 gig model. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's quite all right as a, a bare bones transverter. And I didn't use the Kuhn solution. That's just a recent development. And, you know, I've been working on this thing for a long time. And, you know, how, you know what it's like if you're working on a project like this, trying to figure out what are you going to do, et cetera, et cetera, and make it work. So I had a lot of 78 gig stuff to fall back on. I've been collecting this stuff for years, hoping to finally get enough to get on. Now I actually have three stations for 78. And I use WR15 waveguide. I know that uh, most of the, uh, the stuff like the antenna and, and the preamp and the power amplifier, I use uh, WR12. But again, uh, you know, the, the waveguide bands overlap. So if you bolt the two together, it seems to work pretty well. It's not like we're looking for a flat frequency response. I didn't try tuners or everything. Everything seemed to work, so... I wanted to do better uh, receive performance wise, so I've got a, a WA1 MBA uh, prototype preamp with roughly 4 dB noise figure added with a bandpass filter for image rejection. And then I went into a fundamental mixer, so my LO is at 78 gigs. So, and I know the noise figure of that mixer was really good, something like 7 dB. So it's, uh, you know, receive performance wise, it's really good. I had a separate transmit mixer and then a bandpass filter. And then I ended up using a one, uh, WA-1 MBA uh, amplifier as a driver uh, because I had it. I mean, it seems like an awful waste just to use it for that, but uh, what can you do? You got to do what you got to do to make it work, right? So, and then I was able to borrow a Sage millimeter one watt amplifier with 35 dB of gain. And uh, pretty happy about that. It's just a tiny little cube. It's hard to imagine that thing is worth 3,500 bucks. Oh yeah, I mean that's bleeding edge technology there. Like it's wow. Yeah. I had trouble with, with mixers. I, I had about, I don't know, half a dozen mixers that I was playing with. Three of them were the DB6NT style PC board mixers in the milled enclosure. Basically three identical units. And uh, I had, uh, of the three uh, of those, 
Uh, one had about a 12 dB double sideband noise figure, and the other two were like 25. And I could, cannot figure out why. And I talked with Brian Justin a little bit, and he had some suggestions. And there's some, some things I need to do to look at those. But I, I even went as far as changing diodes to a different kind of diodes, and now nah, same result. And you know, played around with LO levels, and and uh, and it's not just uh, noise figure indications or anything. It's it's really a lot a lot worse. Uh, you know, you can see it on a weak signal. So I don't know what's going on there. <coughs> Is that right? Is that right? Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> Sorry, what was? He said that the 12 dB noise figure was the oddball one in his experience. Most of them are 20, and and it makes you wonder. Like DB6 NT always claims, you know, eight and a half dB noise figure. You know, it's it's kind of like, well, okay, what am I doing wrong here? You know, and you do everything. And I had waveguide tuners in there, just trying to see if there was something I could do with matching wise on any port and. You know, I need to look a little closer maybe at the IF port. I know there were some issues with, because I'm using 432 IF, and I kind of trimmed the PC board to get the stray capacitance down to hopefully res you know, move the resonant point of the IF uh, up a little bit, but I never did look at the IF return loss. So uh, I had a couple of other mixers that were kind of uh, surplus uh, 40 gig LO type mixers uh, with uh, dual diodes and things like that. Uh, I think I had a Hughes, Hughes mixer that was uh, uh, converted to dual diodes and they were all like 25 dB. Like, what the hell? This is terrible. So, so anyway, because of the, my, the, the transmit mixer that I had had this 25 dB conversion loss, I ended up using the MBA preamp to overcome the conversion loss of the uh, and get enough drive for the the one watt power amplifier so so anyway with the mixture that I ended up using it had a pretty high lower sideband output and and a lot of LO uh, output you know this is a you know an anti-parallel diode mixture so supposedly the LO is nicely suppressed but it really wasn't and you know the diodes are they're as identical as I can you know you you can get them you know they're the usual HP or whatever, and uh, well, I can't remember, I think some of the mixtures I had, it was a single chip, so I mean, it's all on one chip, and, and then, you know, why the lower sideband was so high, and so, you know, I had a bandpass filter in there, and, and I managed to adjust it, and, and it, it actually kind of nulled the carrier, and it balanced out the lower and upper sideband to be about the same now, which is, that's still pretty crappy. Half my power is going in the lower sideband, which is okay if I'm running a, a rig with no, uh, no filtering out front on the, on the far end, they'll hear me 3 dB better, but uh, anyway. So I've got to look at a better mixer and slash image reject. Uh, I was dealing with one of the companies in California. I sent a mixer back a little gold cube for repair and and I'm hoping that, uh, that that'll come back and I'll be able to put it in and get much better results, but we'll see. And I used a, uh, an, a, uh, an MTS 2000 phase lock loop uh, with very low phase noise. It's actually better than the, uh, either the Kuhn or the ZL2. Uh, so depending on where you look, it's uh, you know, maybe 6 dB better or something. Really doesn't make much difference. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a power hog. Uh, you know, it's uh, a lo you know, it's not low power like the Kuhn or the uh, the ZL2 PLL would be. But uh, no, no, I, I had looked at using those, but I never have never got around to firing those up. But they would probably work well. But how many of them are, are around too? I mean, these. Uh, these these MT, MTS two thousands were kind of a, a couple of uh, leftovers, and there's no more around, so the company's out of business. And and then I used uh, you know a Demi four step sequencer and Demi IF interface. You know no magic there, and this is the block diagram, very similar to what we saw. A uh, few things that are unusual there: uh, the M uh, MBA LNA and isolator. 
a high pass filter, which is really a piece of WR8 waveguide, and then a band pass filter, then this Marconi mixer, and a tripler and a doubler coming uh, from the 13 gig LO down below. And then I had a, okay, the down east, the TCK interface. 432 is the IF that I'm using. And there's this DB6NT mixer that I had trouble with a bandpass filter, an MBA, LNA, an isolator, uh, just to kind of keep the, uh, just in case the, the two amplifiers don't like each other, and the one watt PA, and then I've got a WR12 to 15 uh, tapered waveguide, and then I have a directional coupler for power sampling, which uh, I couldn't get to work. I don't think I have a good detector in there, but, uh, and then the usual four-step sequencer, uh, good 10, 10 meg OCXO, and the synthesizer. And I know these pictures are very cluttered. Uh, this is the waveguide switch. And uh, this is the receive side coming out, the MBA preamp, the uh, isolator, and I think I'm gonna lose it in there. I've got actually a short piece of circular guide as the high pass filter that is, you know, WR8 uh, quasi. And, uh, oh, and I lose it in here in the waveguide. And uh, on the transmit side, here's the output coupler. This is the one watt amplifier is hiding in there. And there's an isolator in there and then the MBA preamp. And uh, we'll look at uh, another picture here. Sorry to turn your heads upside down. Uh, you can see the uh, one watt amplifier a little better. It came with a little bit of a heat sink on it, but that it ran pretty warm. Although, you know, it's not, we're trying to remember what it draws. I think it's 0.6 amps at 15 volts and maybe peaks at 0.8 when you're running it uh, at full output. But uh, if you're playing around with, uh, you know, key down, I wanted this thing to run cold. So I added a little uh, heat sink assembly and now it runs cold. And there's the transmit driver, the bandpass filter. And there's that DB6NT type mixer that I was using for transmit. Um, you can see here there's a 13 to 40 gig uh, multiplier. Uh, boy, I'm having a tough time figuring out what, what I've got in here. The, uh, <laughs> well, no, I think the, the blue thing is just straight waveguide. This, uh, this is the mixer. Uh, no, it isn't. That's the dialed multiplier. Sorry, that's the times two multiplier. And then it's into this Marconi mixer. And then there's the bandpass filter on receive. And then it catches up with the receive chain over there somewhere. This is the MT2000 phase lock loop. You know, it's a big heavy thing. And lots of heat sink in order to keep it cool. Um, it's got a, a BCD type uh, thumb wheel switch for programming the frequency, which is kind of nice. So you don't have to pull out your laptop and run some software to change the frequency. You can just, just do it. It needs uh, uh, 15 and, and 5 volts. And then I've got a, another blade here for 13.8 to run everything that's on the chassis. I figured, well, if I run an AC anyway, I might as well run all the 13.8 stuff from AC. So lots of heat sink because I wanted everything cool and stable. So. Uh, no, I, I don't know if it's, no, I don't think it's one of those. I think it's uh, probably from a traveling wave tube assembly or something. See. Yeah, okay, so another view, same sort of thing. The diode detector that I had for, uh, I, mean, I think this may have actually been a harmonic mixer or something. It didn't work very well as a diode detector, and I didn't have anything else around. I couldn't get much of an indication out off the coupler, which is unfortunate, but... He had the power meter on there with a coupler and, and attenuators and stuff. So, you know, I just tuned for, uh, for best power and then, okay, well, it should stay the same, right? It, when I go out in the field, nothing will change. Yeah, and in some cases it was because the waveguide had a twist in it that I happened to have that went around the corner and then twisted and, and then I had to untwist it and, you know, like having a deep junk box of waveguide pieces is so important when you're playing, trying to match up like this. You know, it's, uh, 
And if you're having to buy those bits and pieces nowadays, that's a lot of money. And even things like isolators and stuff like that, like the eBay prices are crazy now, so. You could probably get a lot of mileage out of that by taking a picture of it. Instead of it the same millimeter wave, it's say, leave it on who is this at home? <laughs> And he'd say, hmm, how, how, how did that Canadian get this amplifier, right? We never didn't have any, export any amplifiers to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got some further work to do. As I mentioned, you know, the, the 40 gig, uh, or not the 40 gig, the, uh, the 78 gig antenna that I have is, is, uh, is meant for the band, but it is WR12. So, you know, whether there's anything to be gained with tweaking it or not, probably not, but it's possible. Certainly on, on 47, I need to do that with the 40 gig ones to have a look and see what they're doing. And I think some, some guys had suggested that they did a little bit of tweaking and, and there was a, some improvement. Yeah. Uh, you know, that transmit image rejection. You know, do I use a better filter or not? Uh, you know, the, the, the transmit image, the lower sideband image that I was having, you know, do I get a better filter? Tom and I were talking and he managed to get one of the very few 78 gig filters that ever came out of Europe and they don't make them now. Uh, they make 76 gig filters, which they'll probably have higher insertion loss, which may be an okay alternative for me. Uh, hopefully uh, if I put a better mixer in there, I can get knock the lower sideband down and and it'll be better. Al? Well, I'm not. It's just the fact that when I, when I fired up the mixer, my lower sideband was 10 dB stronger than my upper sideband. Yeah, well, I'd like to do a lot better than that. But, you know, so I knocked, the LO was high too. It, you know, the LO was about the same level as my upper sideband. So it's like, am I going to waste all this power in, in lower sideband and LO? Yeah. Right. Let me just, just repeat what Jeff is saying. Did everyone hear Jeff? He's basically saying if I had a, a double stub tuner or EH plane tuner on the output of the mixer, I might be able to generate an, the right reflection back in the mixer to kind of knock down the lower sideband and, and the LO and... Uh, Prove the conversion loss and, on the upper side. Right. So you're getting that energy reconverted. That's right. Rene? Uh, well, I built, built the mixer like that and I double stub it. Yeah. The lower sideband is way higher. Is that right? Well, I know DL2AM made some comments like that too, or, and it might have been on 122 gigs or something, but he was having the same kind of issues. That means you need to use high side injection, because then your lower side band will be the right one. And <laughs> There's enough confusion out in the field as it is. We don't need to. <laughs> I, th I think we progressed beyond that, I think. You never get exactly what you want. No. Yeah. So anyway, I do need to get rid of that lousy mixer so I can get some better conversion loss and, and maybe get rid of that MBA driver amplifier, but probably not. But And then I, I, uh, I do want to get a, an output power indication on the one watt amplifier, but... It's probably just a little bit early on some of this stuff, because like you said, the uh, 5G stuff is coming along. Oh, yeah. The IQ mixer stuff is, is the way they love to do the wireless chips. So oh, yeah. No filters in there. That's like facing RF to digital is through the IQ mixer. And they're going to have power indicators because they're going to have... Oh, well, that's right. Monitoring. Well, they got power power control. They have power control and monitoring, so there's going to be detectors coming off that. Yeah. But the thing is, it's all integrated into one little package, and it's can you can you get in there in the middle to get rid of their lousy VCO, say, or, you know... Yeah. Like when, when I was looking at the uh, the automotive radars, which I r never really got back to, I started to try and and uh, and ran into problems with connections to the actual board. But uh, 
you know, they had the image reject mixers in there, and, you know, like you said, there's, there's an indication of the power sampling and everything else in there, you know, and so that, you know, there is going to be better technology coming our way from the <coughs> spin-offs of what industry is doing, so. You're right, though. The unfortunate part I learned years ago is that when they get around to mass production, they have highly integrated systems that can really only do what they do, they're not good to have. Yeah. And they're trying to get rid of uh, SMA connectors. They don't want connectors of any kind. They don't want all that. That's cost money. No. And, and you know, uh, uh, Mike uh, K6ML at the last microwave update was talking about the 122 gigahertz little radar module, and the antennas are on the chip. That's true for the 5G as well. It is, eh? So, and then we've got to... Got to Yeah, and th and those are starting to come out now. I saw the ads for them by one of the manufacturers. The, you know, just a little, just like a Wi-Fi antenna that sits in the corner. It's the transceiver, and it's good for 250 feet. At, uh, and I don't know if they were using 64 gigs for that or you know what it was, but it's early. So anyway, so I need to do something to, so I can see what that I'm actually getting output. So anyway. Um, just to sum up, you know, I've talked about the need for the high-performance systems, which is obvious for us. We want to go further, not necessarily faster, just further. And there's new technologies available now, and I talked about how I built some high-performance systems and work that still needs to be done. So, any questions? Uh, band pass folder. You're using a bandpass folder in the 47 gigahertz. Rig was that homebrew or did you? No, that? that's uh, that's the stock uh, tune one that they sell, and I can't remember what it is, fifty bucks or so. You know, like I think that's what it was. Al, do you remember what those? They're around fifty. 60. Yeah, like it's not worth even trying it yourself. Just buy it. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's a wonderful way to go, and, and it's good insertion loss, all silver plated and everything. Like, he loses not every piece, but he makes it up on volume. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> Hard to imagine how he's making money on fifty bucks. Well, I guess if you spent the the big bucks on the transverters, then the little accessories needed to support it, and the amplifiers, and yeah, and he sells little waveguide bits, and I don't know what the you know, the prices of the flanges are, and, and Waveguide are, are they? Yeah. So, I mean, he's, he, he's done a lot. You know, when you look back at the history of DB6NT, I mean, he's done so much to promote the development of amateur millimeter wave bands. You know, he's been plugging away since the, what, early 90s at least. Yeah. The 76 gigahertz quick support, how long was that around? Yeah, that, that's an old. Yeah. Right? Any other questions? If not, thank you very much.